and uh, reflect on it. Last week it was stress and its cessation that that attracted a lot of people. Life hurts, right? <laughs> But in this this evening, this afternoon, and we can just uh, well, I like to just contemplate how the, these kind of basic experiences of life, things that are just so ordinary, such as happiness and and unhappiness, and what they really are, and how you know, because sometimes our life is caught up in in all kinds of anticipations and and assumptions about things and I found uh, that even when happiness when there is happiness we we seldom uh, can really fully appreciate it because uh, the mind is conditioned to uh, to go on to the next thing so that we it, when something's really going right and everything is extraordinarily pleasant uh, something in us is is programmed to go on to something else just because the, the the programming is is that way to be able to relax and to just be to to have the confidence and the trust in just being conscious and aware because sometimes we feel very guilty if we're not busy going somewhere doing something going on to the next thing In a, in a reflection on life hurts is, is trying to bring our attention to uh, that life basically is, uh, is an experience of, of uh, great sensitivity. It has a lot of feeling in it. It's, a, it's this way, no matter how fortunate or unfortunate uh, the particular things that happen to us might be. Just if you contemplate just your own physical uh, presence, just having a human body. What is it like as an experience? And and you, when you contemplate it, and not judge it, not uh, not make it, not try to make any strong statements about it, but just notice, uh, be aware of what it is to be conscious within uh, the the physical form, the sensitive form that we have. You can see it's a, it uh, is uh, it basically quite a uh, situation that is uh, provides with a lot of physical pain, discomfort, and that that life itself brings a lot of disappointments and disillusionments to to us. Just that we maybe we expect too much from life when we're young uh, and idealistic and, and don't, don't have a lot of experience we we sometimes expect life to be something uh, that we find out later it, it's really not that way and then the mind easily goes into blame and uh, either towards oneself or towards uh, other other people but when you contemplate life hurts then something in us says yeah that's all right why shouldn't it? That's the way it is. Then, then why should we? Why should we expect it to be otherwise? And in that, then it's it's not a it's not a kind of bitter resignation to to a bad experience, but it's a, it's an acceptance of the sensitive state that we're in and and all the possible experiences that we know uh, that we can you know imagine. We begin to. They, instead of dreading or fearing, we began to just take it, take our lives, and learn from them. Learn what we can from what happens to us. Life itself is, you know, as far as we we know, our understanding of it is this way: is that it's it's planetary life, it's physical existence, it's sensitivity. Uh, life to us oftentimes means the the life of our body, so that we because we we uh, 
we tend to identify so strongly and make assumptions about ourselves as being this physical form that we assume that when this form dies that that's the end of life. We can see that we, we just the, the logic there, that, that the death of a human body means that, that life is no longer present. But when you begin to contemplate it more and more, investigate it for what it really is, you, you begin to notice that that uh, this, this body is just uh, something that is temporarily operating within the experience of life. And that because it was born, it will die. And when it's time to, it has come for it to die, then that's, that's the natural, uh, that's what's natural for it. And we begin to see that, the, understand more the amato or the deathless reality rather than see the, the end of life as a physical death. It's also the, a kind of conceit, ingrained conceit in just the way we think, isn't it? That we assume that once we die that's the, the, end, of our, that's the end of life. What about when we're asleep? You know, what happens to the world when we're asleep? Uh, because we're not, no longer conscious of anything other than, say, maybe a few dreams that, that might uh, go through through the mind at that time. Or what happened, in the, you know, in the, the rest of the world, uh, all that's happening, say, in London today, or in Paris, or in Bosnia, or wherever, we can, we, we can contemplate as being, uh, you know, we assume that it's, it's uh, the other human beings are doing exactly the same thing that we're doing or thinking, feeling, uh, conscious uh, beings uh, that are having maybe moments of happiness or sorrow or despair. But we, but as an actual uh, experience now, we don't know. We know, we know that we're feeling at this moment. We know uh, we can know what's going through our mind. They, we can observe the the pleasure or the pain, the, the the doubt or the despair or the indifference or the fear or the the happiness or the joy that we might be experiencing at this moment. That we can know for sure. And so the Buddha's teaching is aimed at that kind of awareness of seeing the, the, how the, the qualities of the conditioned realm are fleeting. They come and go and they, they move very quickly. Uh, they change. They're, they're unstable. You can't, you can't stabilize them. You can't make them last. It's, uh, it's their nature to begin and end. But in that reflection you begin to ask yourself questions like, what is it that can be aware of all this? Who, who is it that knows this? What is it that watches? And that throws us back onto, say, just that, that attentive awareness. Because you can't, you can't find out what is aware, you can only be aware. And this is where we want, what we need to trust in is just that, that being aware, that willingness to just be with this conscious state, with whatever happens to be going on. Noting it, accepting it, reflecting upon it, contemplating it, but not, uh, but not making, no longer just rushing around trying to, to go on to the next thing, to distract ourselves into something else. Uh, like the, 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 the cessation of stress is the willingness to relax and, let, let, and, and stay with the way things are, no matter what they might be. With the 
experiences of life and just notice how how we in the newspapers and the and the mass media and just the on the telephones and the just the the uh, gossip or the experiences of of just our own family or uh, acquaintances the 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 things that happened in in the world such as divorce infidelity adultery uh, uh, just uh, neglect child abuse uh, criminal activities lying and uh, corruption uh, all of these these kind of of uh, subjects are always news for us but what did they actually do to the mind when we hear about uh, say the uh, the the un misfortunes of famous people when what what is so fascinating really about say the 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 unhappiness or the the failures or misfortunes of famous people uh, why do we why do we give so much importance to the the royal family of this country why do we care so much about what why why are we so interested in what they do and so we can because you know when we when we contemplate this we begin to realize our own uh, humanity is the same that we tend to think of ourselves maybe as not being uh, uh, an important or or significant figure in the society but yet we still have the same life hurt experiences and and I don't think we delight particularly delight in the misery of of the the rich and glamorous and famous but it does help us to realize that that it's part of life experience that everyone gets their fair share of it no matter who they are and nobody's really going to get out of it that much because life is like this we we reflect every day we are the owners of our karma heir to our karma born of our karma so this word karma in in the buddhist uh, terminology is quite uh, significant because it, it's about the just the the results of of having been born and having done the things that we've done having said the things that we've said having experienced the things that we've experienced Sometimes, because it is a bit of an exotic word, we, 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 it has, a, we can empower it, has a little more impact, maybe. We just say cause and effect is a bit bland and not so, quite so glamorous or, or, uh, I mean, and yet some of us would, would maybe prefer that because karma always kind of has the sound of ex the exotic orient or some Hindu kind of, uh, esoteric, special quality to it because it's not an English word and yet yet you hear it quite being used quite regularly in, in, in ordinary parlance like about my karma and her karma and the karma of Britain or the karma of Bosnia Herzegovina but what we really mean isn't it, isn't it that we that that the results, the results now say this is the resultant karma, the way it is right now. Say just having uh, left your home and come here, the result of that is that you're here. Why aren't you somewhere else? <laughs> and that what, the, what you're feeling and hearing and all that is a, is the resultant karma of having made the effort to to say uh, get up and get into your car and drive here and and come into this hall and sit down so it's not not anything other than just the most kind of uh, sensible uh, or you know quite uh, ordinary uh, experience so we can we can observe the resultant karma in any moment. It's interesting to as you as you begin to appreciate your ability to do this, you begin to one feels a real interest in in life, 
in what happens. And it doesn't have to be anything special either. Because you, you're, not, you're, not, you're not thinking that you need special kind of extreme uh, experiences for your life anymore. That you don't need to have adventures and, and fantastic uh, special events to, to live your life. Because just the ordinariness of life is what you begin to look at and observe. Where before, uh, maybe you didn't. Maybe you just ignored that. There's so much that one can just just not pay attention to and, and pass over because it doesn't seem significant. We've not given it any, any significance in our lives. And yet, uh, say, just the, the effect of, of having demands made on you or, or we can start resenting it, isn't it? If somebody starts demanding things from us or if... if um, we hear some rather threatening news or or the neighbors start complaining or the or you hear a possibility of of losing your job or or failing the examination or even uh, passing the examination whatever these 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 kind of perceptions they affect our consciousness and we can and we can merely kind of ignore this in fact, much of life can be just an escape from, and just a way of, of kind of avoiding because these things, because we, we tend to worry. We worry about the, the passing the examination or what the neighbors will say or, or whether we'll keep our, our job or whether uh, the, the, it'll be sunny tomorrow, it'll be cold and wet or, or whether, uh, you know, our lives will be we'll be able to maintain them in the, in the same way as we get older. And the, so that, that even though these are worries for us, we inst- with the worry, the worrying part of our life tends to be one of just going on to the next thing. It, it's not resolving anything. One's just caught up in a series of unpleasant mental states uh, that lead to a uh, sense of despair or annoyance or exasperation and then we want to get out of it, get away from it, distract ourselves into something uh, that will stop this this kind of proliferation. So instead of doing that, we think life hurts. It feels like this. When I hear, when the neighbors complain or somebody criticizes me, it feels this way. I remember years ago and. Uh, uh, in in Thailand, there was a uh, some monks, Western monks. Uh, we were they they had just come from the United States and and recently ordained, and they were they'd been reading about these confrontations that were very popular back in the early seventies in in America, where people would confront each other, and they they would say, uh, you know, I think that you're this way, or I feel that you're that way, or whatever feeling they happen to be feeling towards you, they kind of uh, tell you immediately. And uh, and so they were talking about and that this was probably a very good thing to do. And and I could feel this inner terror arising. <laughs> really strong. I mean, almost like you know. Uh, uh, quite a strong fear arose when I thought these monks are, are going to really make my life unbearable because they're going to confront me every day that I'm with them. We won't be able to just pass the day being pleasant to each other and avoiding issues totally. But we're always going to have to go around kind of saying, why did you look cross-eyed at me? Or why? <laughs> And there's a because one really hasn't uh, really maybe fully admitted to oneself the fears and the the hurt and the disappointments of one's own life, and maybe has developed a whole kind of uh, lifestyle around avoidance and and um, just being putting on an act really or or passing things off or dismissing. The, uh, the, when you when you hear of someone that is is quite frank and forthright in what they say, 
one tends to, just the thought of them tends to bring forth a sense of fear or threat. And you can actually feel that. You can actually be aware of, uh, of that feeling. And this is what, what I found very helpful is to, is to reflect on that feeling. You know, one thing, why do I start shaking when, when, the, when people say, I want to share something with you, Samato, <laughs> in the California. And then you think, oh, I'm in for it now. They're going to say things that will hurt me, that will, that will uh, offend me, that will distress my mind. And and so, because you know, they say my own background was a background of of avoidance. From the family I grew up in, we were all uh, kind of determined to to not address real issues, but to always put on a good face and a stiff upper lip and make the best of life, as they said. And uh, which were, worked all right in, in some cases, but in it also made you uh, very unable to relate very deeply to anyone else because the only way you knew how to do was to to be rather nice and bland and and uh, go around pretending that everything's all right and and and, and, and in that of course you you felt uh, the the result was a sense of of never really uh, getting to know anyone and always feeling a bit threatened or frightened at the possibility of anything deeper than just uh, a, a banal super kind of surface pleasantries. And yet each one of us, I think, longs to, to get in there and, and kind of break into the real stuff. I mean, there's something in us also that, that, that wants to know the truth and, and wants to be liberated from our own fears and our own kind of imprisonment of of habits and and attitudes I was reading some about some woman poet uh, who who uh, who who is uh, one of her great lines was uh, invade my privacy <laughs> this uh, this was uh, like a cry from a from a person who lived very private life and yet, you know, it had all the kind of the the defenses up to to make look that's that's exactly what they wanted. And yet, there's also this 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 longing for it to be invaded, to be taken away from from one, not to be left in this state of just a uh, uh, kind of safe isolation from life and from the the feeling of life. One could even look at monasticism as, uh, as 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 that way of a kind of avoidance, and uh, and it can be used like that because monastic life is disciplined. It's based on on uh, a high level of etiquette, duties, and obligations to each other, uh, and and therefore it uh, and and it can be idealized into you know what a really good monk should be, a good nun should be, and and. Uh, it can we can get terribly inspired by the idealism of, of Buddhist monasticism, but in the actual nitty gritty of daily life, one finds that in the sangha life, or the community life of of ma- monastics, uh, you're constantly having to kind of open your heart up to what's actually taking place. Uh, you. You have to, when you're living uh, with each other, the the system of, of say obligations, duties, and that to each other based on on morality. So we we're not, uh, you know, there's no, we have a strong sense of of uh, respecting each other in regards to uh, you know the property and the physical body itself and and the uh, spiritual aspiration of each member of the Sangha. So, I mean, that, that's, that's something that, that we uh, must uh, reflect upon and, and, and treasure and protect. But in the process of getting on with, with daily life, all our kind of faults and weaknesses appear. We can't maintain the, 
the uh, the stiff upper lip is a kind of permanent uh, petrified uh, posture. Can you? You can't <laughs> you can't keep the lip stiff all that for very long and it starts kind of when it starts trembling. And then then also it's uh, um, over the years uh, things you know when one develops. Uh, as you're developing, say, meditation, mindfulness around the way things are, you, you, uh, you become more willing to look at things. You feel more confident that you can actually look at your fears and, and observe them and accept them. Look at the, 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 uh, the anxiety or the worry or the, or the doubt in your mind. Do I really want to be a monk or a nun? Uh, is this really what I want to do with my life? And look at that rather than feel that you shouldn't be thinking like that. Or you begin to to look at your own, say, lustful tendencies, ways that you 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 tend to uh, the the the, the uh, that those desires in one that that want some kind of sensual pleasure or satisfaction. Or the anger, or the jealousy, the envy, or the feelings of self, lack of self-worth. We, one begins to take an interest in these things. Take an interest, rather than than think that these, than than, than look at these things as as something that are in your in the in your way, something that is blocking your spiritual development or something that shouldn't be or you shouldn't be like that. You begin to take an interest in the way it is. What the the fears, the worries, the the tendencies of the mind, uh, no matter how and some of them can be quite uh, you know, quite heavy in in in, in regards to their quality, or they can be uh, uh, maybe just unnoticed tendencies of, of of your life that you've just been so used to. You've never you've never had any perspective upon them. Yet they do leave you w- at the end of the day, maybe with a feeling of incredible loneliness or or feeling of of uh, resentment. Because it's not always that the, the terrible, I mean, really dreadful or unfortunate things have happened to us that, that have ruined our lives, but there can be a whole series of of little th- experiences that that uh, that have influenced the way we tend to react and see and and uh, to the uh, daily life that we have. One thing, just the it's interesting to see. The uh, the, mona- the monks and nuns in regards to authority, because uh, most of us have come from uh, backgrounds where hierarchy is is regarded as almost uh, evil, bad. I mean, that's more so in America, I think, than in Britain, where American attitudes about hierarchy are that it. That the, that there's Americans are so idealistic. They they think that every everyone is ideally equal in every way, men and women equal in every way. There's no difference, and all races, all classes, everybody is is, is should be equal anyway. Should be totally equal, and uh, anything hierarchical then seems to be like a, a something that shouldn't be. Uh, which always leaves uh, uh, this sense uh, uh, of fear or resentment for those who in practical ways maybe are above us or better than we are or in positions of authority. It's interesting to see, say, with the, with the nuns and the monks, the attitude of women towards men, just the, the feelings and, and that, that, that the nuns uh, have about uh, about monks or being they, the the male presence because it's a, the Theravada 
structure is is a very kind of m highly male uh, dominated form. It's a very masculine outfit. <laughs> So I wonder why the nuns want to be with us. <laughs> they resent male authority so much. <laughs> but these things are, are, you know, not to, to justify or to criticize, but to observe the, the feelings that one has in regards to, to these experiences. It's interesting to see when uh, this was sometimes when when a nun uh, has some authority and in charge of things how uh, to see the way monks react to that. Because <laughs> it works both ways. Bhikkhus, uh, you know, bhikkhus are used to being uh, the, the kind of, uh, the, the nuns usually defer to the bhikkhus, so sometimes a nun will, will have some something that she's in charge of, and, and she might get quite uh, authoritative in that position, and it brings up very strong feelings in some of the monks, including myself. <laughs> and so these are the very these are the the. This is the nitty gritty. This is the stuff of life hurts, isn't it? Where you, rather than than ignoring these things, one looks at them, one one watches, one embraces them, and is willing to feel them. Because you know that this is the way to resolve those karmic that 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 kind of karma, rather than just uh, you know go through the usual ways of of reacting to it. One way I think that that's very common among men is to just just suppress, just ignore feeling, because if the things get you know if feelings get too much, you can just kind of kind of uh, turn the other way, refuse to look at it, and and therefore uh, uh, the the karma never is resolved. One is never. One is always caught reacting in the same way through one's whole life, unless we we learn to skillfully resolve these these tendencies or these these uh, kind of hurting things of life as they happen to us. To be uh, the senior figure in a, in a community, be the the, the patriarch, and to 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 be able to fulfill that role within a community without without uh, becoming uh, without becoming attached to it or becoming uh, embarrassed by it, because inevitably we have to, we we relate to each other in in uh, we have to relate to each other as. In different ways, uh, you can't. One somebody has to enter the doorway first. We all can't enter at the, at the same moment. When we go through the the line for the food, somebody has to go first. Uh, there has to be an agreement about how we do things, uh, and and therefore, uh, say the conventions we do have are merely uh, practical agreements. To make life, to simplify life, to make it possible that it this is not, not terribly confused, to to have, a, have an order that we all agree to, and from that order, from that agreement, then it's possible to to be mindful of what's actually what we actually feel, and we realize that 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 in our lives, the more we are willing to actually feel life, to be hurt by life, to accept the slings and arrows, to accept the the problems, the difficulties, the ups, the downs, uh, the willingness to to feel all of it, 
then we then we take then we really can take an interest in our lives when i was saying just a few minutes ago about this confrontation years ago this idea of confronting anyway the monks we all decided to have a confrontation session one afternoon and so uh we all met in this certain place the appointed time and I was petrified but I wasn't willing to admit I was petrified I was pretending that I wasn't you see, because you don't want to look like that because they expect they might actually you know confront you with why are you frightened so I pretended that I wasn't and uh, and therefore one kind of found that myself kind of going to a level of of a kind of wise cracks or kind of silly humor is to to kind of ease the tensions and and uh, make it not so important kind of you know make it less threatening by by filling my m- mind with uh, rather silly thoughts and foolish jokes then then the uh uh one of the monks that was really into confrontation uh, he wanted us to confront him now that's a strange thing i thought they were all going to have a go at me and they're taking this part. but actually this monk wanted us to attack him he seemed to have a great love need for being told off or so and he he is quite uh, a, a difficult character so some of the monks started saying well you know why do you do this and why are you always late and why in and this and, and that and he seemed to quite enjoy uh being criticized and I thought, this is strange and uh so when it came my turn to he says okay uh ajahn samedo what have you got to say about me and I, i decided instead of saying anything critical I just decided to say uh, what I uh, the, the what I found very nice about him so I told him and he was furious <laughs> <laughs> he thought I was lying he thought I was afraid to tell him <laughs> because this was a confrontation this confrontation always have to be uh, critical in confronting each other with, uh, with you know let me tell you about how wonderful you are <laughs> <laughs> rather than I've come to tell you how horrible you are or how much you annoy me and then they finally it came my turn to be confronted and and every one of them said but well, we have nothing to say about you you're okay what a relief <laughs> and I, I i got out of that one because I was really I was, you know really quite terrified they were going to to go in and 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 bring and hurt you know bring up issues or subjects or things maybe they could see things in me that I I wasn't aware of and there's always that fear of having to find out something that you you don't want to really know about anyway and so that, that there is a relief the fact that uh, somehow with me I'd managed to uh get out of it and i realized that that has been a, been a very much a a um trend in my life is managed to get out of a lot of things and so i guess i've, I've developed a kind of uh, a character that everybody thinks is okay and and that uh, i'm perfectly normal and that they don't that people aren't so or else maybe i give off the impression that i'm so sensitive and and that that if they said anything i'd probably be totally shattered by it but anyway my life has not been one where people have have confronted me very much and and uh and had in really sad things that that were all that uh, shattering and it's also i appreciate that it's given me a chance to to develop uh say mindfulness around the the events of life the just the little things of life just the annoyances or the the uh, exasperations that 
that one experiences in daily life. Or because one, because these opportunities were made, made, were available and made conscious to me, there was also an influence, the definite influence of, of, of the suggestion that it might be a good thing to really look and observe. And then reading the Buddhist teachings from that and uh, uh, the Satipatthana, the four foundations of mindfulness, one began to see that actually Buddha was pointing to this, this in, in, in his own way. When he talks about the foundations of mindfulness, he's talking about the, just the, the physical body itself. This, this one's own body with its senses, its eyes and ears and nose and tongue the sensitivity of the whole form with its brain, with its nervous system, with its uh, uh, organs, with its breath, with its mental state, with the ability to feel, to be attracted, repelled through the senses, with the, with the mind itself, with the, with the memories that we have, with the, with the moods of the mind, the fears, the the anguish, the despair, the loves and hates, the, the happiness, the disappointment, the hurts of life. That, that the Buddha was saying, be, you know, be mindful of these. Know these things as they are, for what they really are. Now, the, what they really are in terms of Dhamma is that they, they're impermanent and they're not self. And so I realized more and more that, that why I was so frightened of this confrontation years ago was because I would take any criticism or any, anything, anything in, that was mental or physical uh, as something that would be, it would be filled with a sense of being mine. And, and so therefore, uh, when you're so identified with your body, with your sensitivity with the with your moods and memories thoughts and and tendencies when when that's so strong such a strong identity then one is is there's a, a level of anxiety always in the in 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 the experience of life because these are we we are terribly you know frightened of of what others will say what will the neighbors think what will my friends say, my colleagues, what will the monks and nuns think? What will, uh, so forth, you know, it goes on and on into a, 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 a tremendous self-consciousness and fear of being looked down on or humiliated or despised or, or made fun of or jeered at. And yet in terms of Dhamma, say, the what we're doing is we're, we're, we're looking at all of this as it really is, as, as the fears, the desires, the feelings, the sensitivity, the body itself, are put in the context of whatever is subject to arising is subject to ceasing, whatever is born dies. And so then we're looking at the, the Dhamma of it, but we're still willing to feel it. It's not when this this sense of seeing this this way of contemplating impermanence isn't a dismissal, just a kind of pushing things away, and convincing ourselves that that our feelings are are not ours. It's not. It's not in. It's not like you're, you're trying to convince yourself. It's it's not self. You you're willing to feel. You're willing to be hurt. You're willing to experience. This whole, this, this, a whole life experience in this form, in in all, in all its aspects, because you you know, you begin to know very clearly. You realize the truth of it is that it's not real. It's not yours. It's the karma of birth. It's the way it is. Pleasure and pain, praise and blame, happiness, suffering, success, failure. They. They they appear, disappear. They they that's life. That's what the the flow of life is about. We the, with the these changing conditions, and we 
we are now the observer, the witness, the one who's reflecting on it and seeing it for what it is rather than the conditions themselves. And so instead of being somebody who's frightened or threatened by confrontation, instead of being, being that way, being somebody who's, who's got these anxieties, uh, you change from be, becoming somebody to being aware of these, of this anxiety for what it is. And that means accepting it, letting it, letting it alone, let it be what it is. Willing to, to, to let it be conscious so you're feeling it. You're not, and, and willing to bear with it, be patient, be accepting of it. And to to not be so quick to, to judge it and make some some critical comment or make a problem about it. Just just to to, to let it be what it is. For example, if, if I think in, in those early years when I was afraid of being confronted, there was also the thought, I shouldn't be afraid of being confronted. I should this is probably good for me. It's what I need. I need I need to be told off. I need somebody to come and say, what's wrong with you is this? And, and I say, oh, I'm just so weak, I can't take it, and I'm so frightened by it, and, but I shouldn't be that way. I should be brave. And so you're caught in this, in, this, in this endless kind of struggle in your mind. You're thinking, oh, I, I don't want to, I couldn't bear it if, they, if people said th some things to me, and, and then the other side comes up. But you should, you know, you've got to conquer this fear. You should be brave. You should face life, you shouldn't be so cowardly and and then the other side well, I couldn't, well maybe later on and maybe I should go to a therapist or something uh, this whole uh, you know the the way the mind will will go from being this, this kind of wimpish frightened being into then into the tyrant that that says you shouldn't be that way but in and, and so just that that kind of war, conflict, goes on in the mind. But in mindfulness of it, both are just seen for what they are. It's this so when the, when the uh, condition is, is, is frightened, anxious, worried, it's just this way. And you kind of listen and willing to 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 feel it, like in your body. You can go more towards the, say, the chest or the stomach or around here. You begin to just know just what it like, the kind of tensions you might be feeling, say, in the trunk of your body, by that that kind of anxiety or fear. And you, you can you can reflect with it, saying it's all right to feel this way. You know, just a just a kind of uh, a way of encouraging yourself to 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 not make any problem about it and to to let it be what it is. And then, if you go into the old tyrannical mode of oh, you're so weak, and so you should you shouldn't be this frightened, and and you need to to go to a Psychiatrist and and all that. Then then you can then you can as soon as you're aware of that the the tyrant that's always uh, coming down heavy with its moral judgments value judgments <laughs> that feels like this. So you you're also willing to feel the tyran the tyranny of the that in in you that tends to detest and make. Uh, criticisms about what you you know about yourself, so that it, and it changes. You can't you know it's, it's these and, and you can't at first. It's difficult to to always to stay with it. But as you make a determination, resolution to to do that, you begin to say take an interest. It's interesting because what happens when when you stay with something and you don't make any more karma with it, like you're 
when you're when when you're willing when you're mindful of of a mood or a state of mind or a feeling in the body when you're really mindful of it you accepted it and you you're willing to let it be what it is you're willing to coexist with it then it ceases and and in that cessation it's you've resolved that you're letting go you're not making any karmic connection to it anymore because the karma is the reactiveness out of ignorance isn't it where you you follow it you believe it you 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 know I'm so frightened I can't bear this and then then the other is you shouldn't be frightened you should be brave and then you, that's also you're making heavy karma with well, through the tyrant or through the or through the um, terribly sensitive uh, uh, frightened person personality but that awareness uh, attentive awareness of it is is, is the, the, that you're not making a karma with the condition you you're you're letting it end you're letting it go you're letting it be what it is it's impermanent you're letting it cease according to its nature and then you 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 you're tuning into the peace of your of the, of the natural state of mind when you're letting things cease in your mind you're no longer caught up in just uh unskillful emotional reactions to things that that whole that that whole confusing uh frustrating tendency starts fading out diminishing and you begin to realize the true nature of mind we can call it bliss peace serenity emptiness empty minded or what, whatever uh there's different ways of different uh words that people use but in that there's there's a sense of relief <clears throat> like i remember reading uh some, some zen book years ago and they and they uh they and they were describing the experience of nibbana and it's like you know you've been uh, carrying something heavy and you're you're very tired and then you put it down it feels that's nibbana is like that <laughs> or meeting a good friend at the crossroads an old friend at the crossroads i mean these are these are not like you know uh, ecstasies where you get kind of just gone wild into a state of bliss that is just so so fantastic and these are these are these are uh, happinesses that we ha- that are quite ordinary in daily life but we don't but do you really notice them do you really notice them do you know like when you're really tired and you and you sit down and relax there's that feeling of just being able to to relax what can you really stay with that and notice the feeling of just rest or do you or what what do you do do you 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 can you can just maybe feel tired and then rest uh, sit down to have a rest but then your mind gets caught up with thinking about this or that and and so you don't even notice the nibbanic happiness or that that sense of of just being relaxed and at ease with and 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 trusting in that and noticing it last last week's uh talk was on stress and you can see like the the term the rat race and stress this the way life has uh uh has become such an an ongoing uh speedy experience it seems like we're always in, in going somewhere always having to do something there's this this tension of of uh, a kind of urgency in everything and so and 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 so the rat race you know we go back to the rat race or the uh the stress of modern life because the, it is it's much faster now isn't it you the the all the technology has 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 relieved us of a lot of of kind of tedious chores but in the process it speeded up everything 
because it, we now have to spend more time looking for things to do. And there's, there's more interesting alternatives. There's always, you can go back to university when you're 60 years old. You can, <laughs> you, can uh, you know, there's always in, in a whole kind of menu, lists of, of things that are tantalizing possibilities to get involved with this or that. And the mind is very much conditioned to always be feeling it. there's something that you should be doing. That you shouldn't be just being. I just want you to contemplate this. Uh, how many, uh, is it very easy to just be? And to trust in just being, which doesn't mean that you you don't do the dishes and don't don't go to work and you just decide you're going to be. <laughs> because life isn't like that, is it? Life is it has its. We have our duties to perform and and things like that in life. You know, just the the needs of the body and the and so forth have their force and influence on our life. But we began to kind of relax with the flow of life. We've, we've left, the, we've gotten out of the rat race. We're not caught up in a, in a compulsive uh, pushiness of modern life. And, you, and when you do, when you feel that in your mind, when you feel that sense of, I've got to do this and I should be doing that and I'm sh- just wasting time and all that, then... You can take an interest in that feeling. Now, for the, this next week, when I when assi- assign you your homework, <laughs> is to is to try to take time out during the day, and you get kind of wound up and caught up into the rat race, to take an interest in the feeling. Now, what does it feel like? Rather than than just thinking, you know, criticizing yourself, or here I go again, I'm caught up again, and what does it feel like to feel like that? And and to kind of look, look, just take a look at, at your own body, and the, the feeling or the mood of the mind, and and just question, what is it, what is it really like? And, and, uh, and accept it. Not, not question it in, in the sense, to judge it, but to just bring attention to it is enough, just attention. And see if you can just let it be the way it is, just for a second is 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 fine. You're not, you don't have to succeed in this at all. Failure is completely is allowable. Because <laughs> this is not the rat race. So so this is you don't have to prove that you can do it. It's just it's, I'm just suggesting this as a way of of, that you can change your direction from just the being helplessly caught up into the momentum of your habits and the intimidations of the world to taking an interest in what's actually the, the way it is for you at this time. Not for the way it is, as some, some ideal way it is, but the way it is now, as it, as it as you are conscious of it at this moment, and to and to just reflect and uh, note any kind of just this kind of thinking itself. What does it do to your mind? Does it make you feel insecure, or 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 does it, is it what I'm saying? Is it kind of threatening to you, or is it interesting, or just to to note any 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 emotional reaction you might have? And and just to, to, it's all right. Whatever whatever reaction is there is the way it is, and and, and that willingness to let it be. More you 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 practice with this, then you then you'll find that all the threats, fears, karma of your life will take you to peace, peacefulness. You're beginning to see that even the the hurts of life, the pain, the humiliations, the 
disappointments, well, even the worst side of life, not to mention the just the the little things of life, as you as you accept life as for what it is, it will it all takes you to that inner peace of serenity of the heart, the peaceful mind. And when we say, when, when we contemplate Dhamma, the, the word Dhamma, or the, the truth of the way it is, we use this word opanayako, leading inwards. It says, leading the truth takes us inwards. It takes us to Nibbana, to, the, to that realization of, of non-attachment. And, and realization of non-attachment isn't callous indifference and, and unwillingness to feel, but it's totally being the feeling. Not becoming, but being with it. And, and accepting and letting it be. And then it, you're allowing that which has arisen to cease. And in the cessation is the realization of, of life itself. Because you're you're letting the 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 mortal things, the the birth and death things, the beginning and ending things. You're you're breaking your through the attachment. You're breaking up the illusions you have about them. You've 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 conquered death. Is one kind of heroic way of putting it. <laughs> Or you've just realized the truth of the way it is. And this, no, what, do, what do you think when, when, like death itself, what do you think when you, it's like the end, isn't it? And, and the, like your own death, your physical death, that's the end. Because of because that sense of of death is is very much connected to your your body, the, your identity with the body, and the memories and and attitudes of mind that you you developed. But in the but with mindfulness and understanding of dhamma, that that you're letting go of the, all that conditioning, all those assumptions, all those conventions. You're not getting rid. You're not you're not trying to annihilating, you're letting go. And in that letting go is the realization of the deathless. And so uh, then there's nothing more to fear. Because it's just, it's, you, you have taken an interest in the, in the Dhamma or the way things are. And, you, and then that will also give you the faith and the trust to persevere even through the difficult patches of life. You find you have tremendous ability to use even the worst things that happen to you. Instead of being that which ruins your life, sometimes it's that which awakens you to truth. And many people have told me that. Sometimes a, like a some of the, like a terminal illness or a, some terrible thing that's happened to them has actually awakened them rather than ruined their lives. And that's because they suddenly, they, they, they were, it jolted them out of maybe the momentum of just habitual behavior. They had to look at something in a different way. And now here, I'm saying in terms of Dhamma, what I'm encouraging you to do is to, to develop the way of looking at things in terms of, of the Dhamma, of the way it is. And that allows you to have the, the understanding, the perspective on the personal experiences, the unique, the eccentric, the odd, the unexpected uh, things that happen to us, as well as the ordinary, habitual uh, tendencies and functions of, of life. We see it then in terms of the way it is rather than the way we think it is. So I offer this as a reflection for this afternoon. Time now for tea. And uh, 15 minutes we can then uh, reassemble for further discussion. <laughs>